you know, it just becomes like a, a, a polka dot, you know, and there's no real rhythm to them. There's no, you know, it, it makes the image look really, really flat and dull. So if I am going to start throwing in some other types of lighting in here, I want to be really, really smart about it. I want to make sure that first they kind of all lead you to look in, into a certain area. So if I am going to add in a little couple of bits of light over here, you know, I want to make sure that they're not competing with what's kind of going on in this more focal area over here. So, you know, I can I can throw in a couple of bits of light, you know, maybe paint them in. I can use curves or whatever, you know, it doesn't really matter. But right now I'm really kind of worried about where the placing is of these things rather than um, how I'm actually painting them in. So um, as long as you know, I'm giving it an appropriate amount of, of attention to making sure that it's not taking away from anything else, then um, that's basically what I'm trying to do. Okay. Um, our next question is from Don. Um, Don asks, what other exercises do you recommend for sketching or drawing environments? Um, Number one, just always draw. Um, I can't. I can't really express how important basic drawing is to um, how important that is to to painting. You know, it's a very. It goes hand in hand together, and it's very very important to be a strong draftsman. I think. Um, the second thing that really helped me doing better environment work was doing actual landscape paintings. Um, maybe an acrylic or gouache or you know even oils but oils can get a little bit messy gouache is actually a, a pretty nice um, paint medium to go out you know out on location maybe to the mountains or you know to to wherever to kind of do that kind of stuff um, very 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 important class for me it really helped me develop um, you know a lot of the skills that I have today with doing environments um, there's no, there's no other way to get around being a better digital painter than just being a good painter in general. You know, that's very, very, very important. Um, so, you know, if I know a lot of schools and, uh, you know, like private art classes, you know, they offer a lot of that kind of stuff. So if that kind of place is available um, to just, you know, do some plain air, you know, out in the open painting, then I would highly recommend that. Awesome. And along the same lines of that, I have an, a new question from Cass Wagner, uh, who asked, uh, well, says, hello, James, and thank you for your time. Um, his question is, uh, have you ever experienced long periods of burnout, especially during deadlines? And if you do, what tips can you suggest to get through it? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely get burnt out. Um, for example, you know, working in freelance, it's you don't have a consistent amount of work that's at the same level throughout the whole year. Sometimes you're going to have times when it's slow and other times you're going to have times where it's unbelievably busy and you're, you know, working seven days a week and trying to get stuff done. Um, one of the things that I believe is, is the most important is if you are starting to feel burnt out is, um, try to find as much balance in your life as possible, you know. Doing this type of work, I don't really see it as work, you know. It's a lot of fun for me, so I don't really see it as work. I just, I'm just really happy that I'm getting paid to do this kind of stuff. Um, however, you know, if you're doing too much of it, anyone is going to get burnt out. So it's, it's really important to find that balance, you know, making sure that, you know, you're still going out and seeing the sun, you know, getting some daylight, um, you know, hanging out with some friends. Sometimes, you know, with being a freelance artist, though, uh, one of the cool things is that I'm not constrained to working from, like, 9 to 5 p.m. You know, within, within 24 hours, if I'm able to get that work done, you know, I'm able to get it done. So sometimes I'll just go out, you know, maybe take a drive to the beach, get some air, you know, just kind of refresh and then just kind of come back and, and, you know, do a couple more hours and see how I feel at that point, you know. Um, and one of the things that's really important, too, is... I've worked with a couple of art directors that are very, very mindful of that kind of thing. They know that we're not robots. We're not able to produce 
you know, awesome artwork every single minute that we're working. And some art directors are really, really mindful of that, and they, th and they say, you know, hey, if you feel burnt out, you know, uh, why don't we just hold this off until tomorrow, or, you know, why don't you take a couple hours and just, you know, um, get some fresh air. And having, having that kind of experience really, really made, you know, the whole work experience so much better. So, but, you know, I think finding a balance is really important. Okay. Now we have time for two more questions. I should say unique questions. Um, so everybody else that asks uh, more than one question, I'm sorry we couldn't get back to you. Uh, but we'll ask these last two questions um, before we end this live Q&A. Um, our next question is from uh, Yosra. Uh, ask, is outsourcing something very common in, Ameri in the American game industry? Yes, very, very common. Um, a lot of outsourcing um, becomes, it becomes very, very important for some companies to outsource. Uh, it, number one, it helps them get some other type of um, influence or, or, or ideas that they wouldn't normally have within their, within their um, t internal team. But yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of outsourcing that goes on. Okay, our next question is from uh, Gabriel uh, Pasotti. Um, he asks, uh, how do you choose your perspective lines and focal point? Um, one of the things that I try to do is I have a very basic formula when it comes to, pers um, to my focal areas. And let me just draw some of these things out. Is I would want to break down my composition into thirds. Hopefully you guys could all see what I'm doing over here. So these are pretty much just third marks. I'm going to draw these all down. Oops. Okay. And these intersection points over here become where I'd ideally like to place my focal areas. Okay. So making sure that something's not dead in the center, like over here, you know, or dead in the center over here. You know, I want to avoid some of these halfway lines. I want to avoid those. But I want to use these red lines to use as better focal areas. Um, now, when it comes to perspective, um, I believe that um, you, you guys probably have access to the perspective grid that I, that I used. But when it comes to perspective, um, Number one, I don't like to put my perspective grid down before I start my painting. I like to paint up some shapes first, maybe get a really interesting point of view, you know, like a nice angle, and then once I have that in mind, I'll use my perspective grid to help me figure out, you know, if my perspective is, is, uh, is accurate and correct. So, um, cool. Yeah, uh, yeah. This, uh, this, this formula over here of breaking things things down into thirds, I think it's, it's pretty universally used by a lot of people, um, traditional old painters as well. So this is a really, very, uh, it's a very good kind of formula to kind of use as a starting point. Awesome. And a quick question before we get, give our very last one. Uh, the, this one is, how often are you supposed to make new layers in Photoshop when doing digital paintings? That's from Rena Cheng. She wants to know. Uh, that is actually a more about personal preference. Um, some people I know, they like some matte painters that I know, they put everything into layers because they want to have the controllability of moving any element around. Like even like a tree, they can move slightly around, or a car, they can move anything around. But for me personally, um, if I want to try to put a new element in my piece, like maybe a spaceship over, like a ship flying around or something. Um, I'm going to put that on a new layer because I'm not sure if it's going to work out yet, you know. And um, playing around with that idea first before making it a, you know, 100% commitment in my piece, you know, I'm going to put it on a new layer. Once I'm comfortable with it, you know, I can flatten it down into the into the layers again, you know. But anything I'm not really too sure of, I'm going to put on a new layer. Awesome. And our very last question to close out the live Q&A actually comes from Victor Luna. Um, and that was, 
what was the worst advice you ever received about your career? Um, I think the worst advice about my career. That's that's a really interesting question. Um, I thought too. Uh, the worst advice. Um, I think the worst advice was that was, you know, there's always going to be people that are, you know, trying to help build you up, and there's also people that are always going to try to kind of knock you down a little bit. And I think um, some of the advice that people gave me were not to um, help me at all. You know, they, they weren't trying to be nice or anything. They were actually trying to be a little bit like having a little bit of sabotage in a sense, you know. Um, but I think, you know, some of the advice was that, you know, hey, you know, there's there's a there's a ton of other people that are better than you, um, you know, kind of kind of those kinds of words, and oh, you're never really going to make a career in this. It's never going to last. You know, the video games are just kind of like a fad. You know, that sort of thing. Um, but definitely, that's that's, you know, industry itself has has proved that statement wrong um, incredibly. You know, and I just think that. You know, that was that was probably you know some advice that was given to me where you, you know you should probably think about a different career. It's not really going to last long. Um, you know, video games. You don't know what's going to happen in in another five or ten years. And five ten years later from that statement, you know, video games have outgrossed the film industry. You know, it's you know almost every any, every other film is being made from maybe a video game or comic book title. You know, it's it's just become just this incredible thing. So. Um, actually, a lot, a lot of one of the point is that prior going to art school, um, yeah, I had a, I, I got a lot of slack because just going to art school in general, like, what, are, what are you gonna do? Um, are you gonna go out and you know just do paintings and sell them to people, or how are you gonna make a living? You know, and I was getting a lot of that kind of stuff. And um, but one of the things that's great about going to the art center and, and being actually located in, in Los Angeles is that it's it's a very it's a very uh, um, it's a center point for a lot of commercial art, you know, which is which is great. So awesome. Well, I like to thank everyone for uh, attending this live Q and A with James, and especially I like to thank James for giving us his time and you know answering all our questions. Um, for those of you who are still interested, we have a few more workshops left on our site. Uh, that y'all can still purchase, and if anything, you can also purchase all of them uh, as one, you know, package as well to to look at again if if you want. Um, beyond that, please make sure to fill out all the surveys, um, especially for James if you like what he had to say, um, and also look for this live Q and A to be released uh, sometime this week, uh, possibly Monday, I believe. Um, and also we'll get a, a hold of this, this PSD that he wonderfully painted while he was talking to us, um, uploaded to the site as well. So again, thank you all for attending, and James, thank you so much for your time and for a wonderful job. Thank you so much, everyone, for uh, coming by. Hopefully we can do this again. Awesome. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.